Caudal epidural block is one of the most frequently performed regional procedures on children. It's used to provide surgical or procedural analgesia from the umbilical region to the toes and provides infants and kids with better pain control, less exposure to general anesthetic agents, and a faster recovery. While the landmark technique has been used since the 1930s, the ultrasound guided method is simple, slick, satisfying, and safe, and has been shown to reduce block failure and complications. In this video, we'll describe the rationale, anatomy, sonoanatomy, and technique for ultrasound guided caudal block. If you want to perform caudal blocks safely and effectively, you must know the anatomy. Here's a sagittal view of the end of the vertebral column. We see the last two lumbar vertebrae and the sacrum, made up of five fused segments. At the very end is a coccyx, or tailbone. The lumbar spinal canal runs between the vertebral bodies and the posterior arches of each vertebra and continues down to the sacral canal. Note that the posterior arch of S5, and sometimes S4, is absent. The opening it leaves is called the sacral hiatus, and this is how we're going to access the caudal epidural space. The sacral hiatus is covered by the sacrococcygeal ligament. The dural sac typically ends midway along the sacral canal, at about S3 in infants, and shifting cephalad to S2 by age 3. It contains CSF and the cauda equina. Distal to the end of the dural sac is what we consider the caudal space. This is where we're going to deposit our local anesthetic. It contains the few remaining sacral nerves, the coccygeal nerve, as well as some epidural fat and a plexus of epidural veins. The caudal epidural space here communicates easily with the thoracolumbar epidural space so that with enough volume, local anesthetic placed here can move north and get you a block of the lower trunk. Here's a posterior view of the sacrum. We can see the sacral hiatus at the most caudal aspect, flanked by two bony prominences, the sacral cornua. These are remnants of the unfused vertebral arches. In the landmark-based technique, we're taught to feel for the posterior superior iliac spines and imagine an equilateral triangle, with the apex giving us a location of the hiatus between the cornua. This sounds easy, but it's often challenging because of anatomic variation and excess subcutaneous fat. Which brings us to this question. Does imaging help? You betcha. Here's the issue. Most of the time, the landmark technique works just fine. But in up to 25% of cases, the needle tip and local end up in the wrong place. Subcutaneous injection is not uncommon, leading to a failed block. The AP distance of the sacral hiatus is not large, usually about 3 to 5 millimeters, so it's easy to push the needle through and into the substance of the ventral sacrum, especially because it's incompletely ossified and quite soft. Finally, the dural sac in newborns is about 10 to 15 millimeters away from the hiatus, but can be less than 5, and intrathecal injection has been known to happen. Ultrasound helps by taking all the guesswork out and allowing you to place a needle accurately in the caudal epidural space. Ultrasound guidance has been shown to reduce the number of needle passes and the incidence of subcutaneous, bony, or intravascular needle placement compared with the landmark approach. These authors went so far as to say that ultrasound use is so obvious as to remain unchallenged. Okay, so let's do it. The patient position is exactly the same as the landmark block. Patient on their side with the hips and knees flexed. This provides access to the sacral hiatus, but also tends to pull the dural sac cephalad slightly. A linear high-frequency transducer is placed over the midline of the sacrum, just cephalad to the gluteal cleft. You should see the vertebral bodies and arches of S2, 3, and 4, and the bodies of S5 and the coccyx. The dural sac can be observed as a hypoechoic structure coming to a pointed end around S2 or S3. The phelum terminale is a thin terminal extension of the pia that attaches to the coccyx and anchors the dural sac caudally. Overlying the sacral hiatus is a sacrococcygeal ligament, with sub-Q fat and skin overlying that. The caudal space is occupied by epidural fat, seen here. Traveling in a cephalad direction, we see the continuation of the dural sac into the lower lumbar region, as well as pulsations of the CSF being transmitted to the epidural space. Once you have the appropriate view, a needle is advanced in plane from the caudal aspect. Take care to stay shallow, as the hiatus is not very deep, especially in neonates. We typically use a 21 gauge 100 mm block needle for its echogenicity as well as the enhanced appreciation for different tissue and fascia layers we get compared to a sharp needle. Let's see what this looks like. The needle is directed to contact and pass through the sacrococcygeal ligament. You may feel a slight give as this happens. Aspirate and give a test injection with half a mil of saline. Oops, that looks like it's expanding subcutaneously. Let's redirect. Ah, that's better. Our test injection shows expansion within the epidural fat of the caudal space. 
We'll switch to our local anesthetic, aspirate one more time, and administer the full dose slowly using intermittent aspiration. For local anesthetic, we like 0.2% rapivacaine with epinephrine at 1 to 400,000. You're not after a motor block, so a dilute solution like this is effective and safe. Like all epidural blocks, it's volume that determines the extent of the block. If you're after sacral dermatomes only, say for genitive urinary or perineal indications, half a mil per kilo will do the trick. For lumbar dermatomes, say for lower limb surgery or inguinal hernia repair, 1 mil per kilo is appropriate. And then 1.25 mils per kilo is what you typically need to get up to the umbilicus and to provide visceral relief for manipulation of the spermatic cord and orchiopexy. For indications above the umbilicus, success rates tend to drop because of inconsistent cranial spread. Better to do a lumbar or thoracic epidural or a rectus sheath block. People have put lots of potions into the caudal cauldron, but generally, most don't do much for block quality or duration and may cause side effects. These are the three most talked about. Clonidine does extend the sensory block and has been used extensively and safely. In a one mic per kilo dose, you won't see much of the sedation, hypotension, and bradycardia seen with higher doses. Caudal morphine is a great analgesic therapy, but does have the usual side effects such as nausea, pruritus, and because of the risk for respiratory depression, patients should be monitored postoperatively for 12 to 24 hours. Preservative-free ketamine does work, but concerns about toxicity to the neural tissues has pretty much killed its use. If you want to extend your block for routine single injection caudal, use clonidine. Or you can place a catheter. Caudal catheters are easy to place and can be threaded up even to thoracic levels. Rather than use a stiff TUI needle, an easy approach is to insert an 18 gauge IV cannula, as in the single injection method, then thread a regular 20 gauge epidural catheter through that. The main challenge with caudal catheters is knowing where the tip is, because they don't always go in a straight line. Historically, we used x rays, myelograms, or stimulating catheters to confirm placement. But hey, we have ultrasound, right? Especially in infants and toddlers, it's easy to scan the lumbar and thoracic epidural space and watch for dural displacement when saline is injected to confirm the level. Here are suggested volumes for dosing a caudal catheter. As is always the case with epidural analgesia, some titration to effect is required. When should you not consider a caudal block? Well, certainly if there's something in the needle path, such as a pilonidal cyst or local infection by the gluteal cleft. Like any neuraxial procedure, the patient must have normal hemostasis in case of vessel puncture. And finally, caudal blocks can be dangerous in patients with spinal dysraphism, such as tethered cord syndrome or dermal sinus. If a patient has signs of other spinal or meningeal anomalies or cutaneous stigmata such as sacral pits, get a proper ultrasound or MRI exam to ensure normal anatomy. And yes, things don't always go as planned, but in general, caudal anesthesia is very safe. The biggest complication is block failure, and even that is only 1%. Now, the data from this excellent study comes from high-volume pediatric centers, and it's likely that the failure rate in less expert settings is somewhat higher. Blood aspiration occurs occasionally, but the rest of this list, and thankfully the very serious items, are very rare. Thumbs up indeed! Here are some caudal tips and tricks. First, a common novice error is to drive the needle deeper than necessary, which usually results in hitting the coccyx or sacrum. This is partly because that's how we used to start the landmark technique, with a steep angle through the skin and then flatten out to pop through the ligament. With ultrasound, stay shallow until the needle is visualized on the screen and then adjust as necessary. Second, you may have read about the frog sign as a sonographic landmark. This refers to a transverse scan of the hiatus, showing you the two cornua, the eyes of the frog, the ligament, and the sacrum itself. While some find this truly riveting, it's unnecessary as the midline or slight paramedian sagittal position gives you everything you need and we don't advocate doing this with an out-of-plane needle direction. It could be a fragment of my imagination, but sagittal imaging in babies and toddlers is easy. Commit to using it and you'll be fine. Okay, I'm done with the puns. Forgive me. Ultrasound guided caudal blocks are simple to do and the imaging removes a lot of the mystery and anxiety for novices and pros alike.